happy to introduce today Andy Jewell. Andy got his bachelor's at the University of Wisconsin in Zoology and got his master's at Oregon State with Gary Tagle, um, where he worked on the biology of shallow water methane vents. And then he went on to his PhD at Scripps where he worked with Michael Latz, Latz and Farouk Adam. And his work there focused on the effects of small scale fluid dynamics on red tide dinoflagellates. Um, after his PhD, he went on to research positions at uh, the EPA Gulf Ecology Division and at Woods Hole Oceanographic Institute. And currently, he is both a Lamont Associate Research Professor at Lamont Doherty Earth Absor Observatory and is an adjunct associate professor in Earth and Environmental Sciences at Columbia. <laughs> Um, so, in addition to all that technical stuff, he was a teacher for C the Sea Ed Education Association, which is one of the programs that takes undergrads out sailing for a few weeks and teaches them about oceanography. And he also started the graduate level biological oceanography course at Columbia, where he, for which he won a Best Teaching Award in Envi Earth and Environmental Sciences recently. And I know him because I did an RU with him when I was an undergraduate student, and then I continued working with him for my undergraduate thesis. And he's really great with students, so I would encourage students to come meet with him. And we've reserved some time today at 2.30 after lunch if students want to come to the Okubo room and talk with him. So um, his past research has been on a variety of things, harmful algal blooms, eutrophication, water quality, microbial food webs, um, and today he's going to talk about his work in the Arctic on the ecology of sea ice microorganisms. So, here's Andy. <laughs> seems like it's a much bigger um, barrier than it really ought to be. But anyway, it's nice to be back. Um, so uh, since I haven't been here for so long, and I'm guessing that probably most people don't really know who I am very much, so I'm going to uh, give a little bit of a description of some of the other things that, oh, what's going on here? All right, give a little description of some of the things that I do um, um, by way of introduction. So um, in general, I'm Basically, a plankton biologist. Um, there are a lot of people who study plankton who focus on one or another group of organisms, phytoplankton, zooplankton, or whatever. And, um, I don't have that kind of focus. Um, I guess I could put it in a more positive way by saying that I, I like to look at things in a more holistic way, perhaps. Um, so I'm interested in uh, the way that bacteria, phytoplankton, and zooplankton interact with each other um, and also uh, with the physical and chemical environment that they find themselves in, rather than, let's say, focusing on one particular subgroup within the plankton. Um, and that perspective um, finds application in a variety of different ways. So um, I've been doing some work on estuarine nutrient and sewage pollution, um, particularly lately in the Hudson. Um, I've also done some work on uh, noxious and harmful algal blooms. Uh, I'm also currently involved in um, a project looking at planktonic biodegradation of oil and gas in the Gulf of Mexico. That's part of the follow-up to the Deepwater Horizon spill uh, from a couple of years ago. Um, and those are all fairly applied um, things. Probably the most esoteric thing that I do is um, what I'm going to talk about today, which is the ecology and uh, biogeochemistry of Arctic sea ice algae. Now, I recognize that um, sea ice algae is not um, planktonic, um, and so I've already violated uh, my description of myself, my lame attempt to try to categorize myself. Um, but I will say that um, my thinking about um, Sea ice algae is, um, let's say, inspired by what I know about the plankton. Um, and in some sense, there is a similarity. I mean, it is a primarily microbial system. Microbial uh, 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 organisms uh, live inside the ice, um, and uh, they are suspended in water. It's just that the water happens to be crystallized. I'll give a brief overview of the talk today. Um, I'm going to talk about, introduce the, the sea ice ecosystem and talk about the seasonal cycle, which is very strong. In, in the Arctic. Um, I'll talk about some of my observations, some of our observations of export from, from sea ice, uh, uh, the timing of that export, and some of the potential mechanisms that drive those events, which are quite dramatic 
and uh, then I'll talk about the role of vertical migration of the algae um, in influencing the timing of that uh, phenomenon. Um, I have a whole bunch of slides at the end on the fate of the exported materials, um, basically uh, a lot of measurements of sinking rates that we've done. Uh, I'm almost certainly not going to get, get to that point. Um, but, we'll do uh, that first, then. <laughs> <laughs> if anybody wants to talk about it, I brought those slides along just yeah. in case somebody wants to talk about it. So, um, uh, it would be totally inappropriate for me not to start out by talking about my collaborators, because uh, this work um, is very involved, a lot of field work. Um, and so let me highlight uh, the people that I work with. So Christopher Krems, who used to be at the University of Washington, uh, was the guy who got me first involved in uh, sea ice work. Um, a good friend of mine from a long ago, and we just decided at one point, well, we should just work together. And so that's how I got into it. Um, he's actually left academia, and now runs a program on water quality in Puget Sound. Um, and so for the last couple of years, I've been working with uh, Susanna Neuer from Arizona State University. Um, and uh, Cal, uh, most of the work that most of the data that I'm going to show you today is stuff that I've done in collaboration with Craig Homack, who's a postdoc working with me at, at Lamont. Um, he will need a job soon, so in case anybody is a good postdoc. Um, and uh, Kyle Kinsler, Brittany Held, and Brian Eddy are all students of Susanna's um, who have uh, worked with us in the field. Very important. A little geographic orientation. Um, all of the data that I'm going to be showing you today comes from samples that were collected from uh, near shore, seasonal, fast ice near Barrow, Alaska. So this is all ice that is, um, forms in the winter, um, breaks up in the summertime. Um, so it, it's not the pack ice. It's very, actually very different from pack ice. Um, and um, just to show you where we are, so uh, this is obviously a map of Alaska. This point up here is called Point Barrow. And if we zoom in on that, um, so this is that point. This is the northernmost point um, in the continental United States and the northernmost city, well, the northernmost town in the, in the United States is uh, this little town here called Barrow, Alaska. It's about 3,000 people live there. Um, two flights a day with Alaska Airlines. It's pretty easy to get to, um, very convenient. Uh, just north of town, there's a, an old uh, Navy base and uh, NSF has converted that into a field station um, and uh, it's actually a really nice facility. Um, so most, uh, in fact, all of our, all of the data that I'm going to show today are collected kind of from this region over here or over mm -hmm. here. So within maybe 10 kilometers of Point Barrow, um, probably maybe a couple kilometers offshore. Um, so what gives the land that yellowy color? What gives the land that yellowy yeah. color? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm not sure. I imagine that's just the, well, I don't know if this is true color, to be honest. <laughs> probably not. Um, so yeah, what we do is we, uh, we hop on snow machines at the field station and then drive out to our study sites. And of course, this is all frozen at the time we're out there. So if you go to Barrow and you look out over the Chukchi Sea in April, which is typically when we're there, this is kind of what it looks like. This is a uh, sundown in April. Uh, uh, within a few weeks of this, the sun no longer goes down for the rest of the summer. Uh, so this is early April, and uh, looking out over this frozen Chukchi Sea, uh, you get kind of a a feeling of desolation. Right? Um, this is not when you would expect there to be a lot of biological activity going on. Um, in fact, you know, the tundra is totally frozen. There's virtually no sign of animal activity anywhere. There's no birds or anything. Um, but there is actually a tremendous amount of action going on here. You just have to know where to look for it. And so what we do is we drill into the ice. And so um, we drive out on snow machines. We use a, a hand core like this. Um, it's basically just a big hollow drill bit, and with that we can extract ice cores. Uh, here I'm standing holding a, an ice core. So the part of the ice that was in contact with the atmosphere is up on this end, and the part of the ice that was in contact with the water is on that end. Um, and I put an arrow there to draw your attention to the fact that it looks like there's something different about the ice down there. If I was to turn that ice core so that you were looking at this face, it would look like that. So, there's some pigmentation on the bottom of the ice. <clears throat> and um, that's not just a, a patch of that stuff, but actually um, it's a continuous layer that runs throughout the entire bottom of the ice. And you kind of get a feeling for that. Uh, from this picture here, this is a, a chunk of bottom ice that 
that got knocked off when we retrieved an instrument uh, that had been frozen in the, in the water. And you can see there's this layer, uh, that um, horizontal layer that goes kind of everywhere in, uh, that's a two-dimensional feature on the bottom of the ice. And if you were to take a thin section of um, a chunk of this and look at it under a microscope, you might see something like this. Inside the ice, there are these channels. And inside those channels, you find organisms. This is a dicon living inside one of these channels. So <clears throat> that's very different than freshwater ice. I mean, most of us are used to freshwater ice. That's the ice in your cocktails or your, so or your soda. Um, it's uh, very hard. It's a solid crystal. And it's very different from saltwater ice. Um, there are organisms inside freshwater ice. Uh, when a lake freezes over, algae and other things will get frozen into the ice. They are trapped within that ice. They do not grow. And that's very different than what happens in saltwater ice. In saltwater ice, the organisms uh, not only uh, are there, but they're actually thriving. So saltwater ice and freshwater ice are very different. Um, and that's actually something that you can see. Um, here I am holding two pieces of ice. Uh, this piece of ice here, this is saltwater ice. Here it is again. And this is freshwater ice. Um, and so I think you can see that they are clearly different in that the freshwater ice is not only translucent, but it's transparent. So you can see, in this case, you can see my glove, the orange of my glove behind this. Um, the saltwater ice um, is translucent. You can see the shadow of the glove, but you can't really see the glove. So saltwater ice really scatters the light much more than freshwater ice. Um, and uh, of course, they differ in more important ways uh, than that. Um, this is uh, just showing Brittany putting a couple of drops food coloring on a chunk of an ice core. Okay, so she's put that down there, and you can already see that that food coloring is starting to migrate through the ice. And so this is over the course of maybe like 10 minutes, that food coloring is going throughout the ice. <clears throat> that doesn't happen in freshwater ice. Freshwater ice, you put a bunch of food coloring on the top, it might just sort of run down the side, um, but it's not gonna go, it's not gonna penetrate inside of the ice. And that's the key difference, at least from a biological perspective. So seawater ice, salt water ice, is porous. If you take um, salt water and you freeze it, you don't get a solid crystal. Um, this is a, a thin section from a piece of um, artificial seawater that was frozen. We used artificial seawater because we didn't want there to be any organisms in it. And when you have um, sterile seawater or sterile artificial seawater and you freeze it, you get this really even structure of pores um, inside the ice. And what's happening is, um, as the ice is slowly freezing, the ions are excluded from the crystal matrix. And so they get forced out into the remaining fluid. Um, that depresses the freezing point of that fluid. And it depresses it sufficiently that it will not freeze. Uh, and so um, you get this uh, uh, dynamic interplay between the crystallization of the of the water um, and uh, these saltier and saltier brines as the temperature falls. <clears throat> and so uh, seawater ice or saltwater ice is always uh, a matrix uh, consisting of um, crystallized water uh, and then uh, high salinity brine that's too salty to freeze. And it's the, the, this matrix, uh, composite, two, two different kinds of composition of stuff that causes it to scatter light as much as it does. Um, and from a biological perspective, the fact that it is porous means that there is habitable space inside. That's not the case with freshwater ice. That's the big difference. Um, and so in fact, there is a, um, an entire microbial biofilm that um, forms inside of uh, these pores. So if you take um, artificial seawater and you freeze it, you get this nice regular pore structure. Uh, if you look at real sea ice and you do a thin section of it, um, you typically will find that inside those pores, there's all kinds of organisms. In this case, um, diatom cells, those little green things. And um, here's another view, a little bit of higher magnification. So these are stacks of diatoms inside this brine channel. Um, and in this case, what we did was we added a polysaccharide stain um, to the sample. And so this blue is revealing that um, that these organisms are embedded within this uh, sort of 
mucousy matrix of goo that they exude. Um, uh, so the entire inside of the ice is, um, uh, has this uh, network of um, what we call extracellular polymeric substances, or EPS, uh, that the uh, organisms exude. And so you, know, you have these organisms embedded within this uh, goo, and that's sort of what gives it this uh, biofilm character. All right, well, um, seasonality in the Arctic, of course, is extremely dramatic. Uh, so for example, um, near Barrow, there's essentially continuous night from mid-November to late January. Um, and although there are um, algae uh, incorporated into the ice as it freezes, obviously when it's dark, they're not doing anything, right? But as soon as you get any light available, and in Barrow that happens you know, certainly by uh, early February, um, you start to get growth of those algae, the, the, the beginning of a bloom uh, within the ice. Um, and initially, for sure, light is the limiting resource. And you would think that if light is the limiting resource, then maybe the organisms would be up near the top, right? That's what happens in the water column, right? Phytoplankton pre uh, predominantly are growing near the upper part of the water column, certainly uh, at the beginning of the spring. But that's not what happens with the algae. So uh, the algae bloom occurs in the ice bottom. And here's just some data from one year. This is a time series going from December um, to July, I'm uh, sorry, June. Um, and uh, so this black region here is just showing the, the thickness of the ice. Um, so in December, the ice was about 50 centimeters thick, uh, and it increased through time. And maybe by late uh, April or so, typically ice growth stops. Um, the ice persists for a long time um, without getting any thicker or any thinner. Um, and then sometime in probably mid to mid June to to um, mid July, the ice breaks up. Okay, the uh, the color contours here show um, chlorophyll concentration, and as is the usual convention, um, warmer colors mean more chlorophyll. Uh, so you do get some uh, growth of phytoplankton uh, in late January, early February, phytoplankton, ice algae, uh, and um, they grow slowly. Um, you really get uh, dramatic growth um, in April and May, and then um, typically the, uh, the biomass inside the ice, or at least the chlorophyll inside the ice, um, drops off um, by late May, early June, well before the ice um, uh, begins to thin or break up. Um, a couple of fun facts about ice algae. So um, this occurs all over the Arctic, and their current estimates suggest that uh, the ice algae bloom probably accounts for something like 15 to 20 percent of annual Arctic marine primary production. So it is quantitatively a pretty big source of, um, of primary production for the Arctic marine system. Um, the algae that you find down here are uh, generally quite distinct from the phytoplankton. Um, typically, the biomass is dominated by pennate diatoms, and they tend to be, um, the species tend to be more closely related to species uh, that are found uh, in the benthos. In fact, some of the species that you find in the ice are the same species as you find in the benthos up there. So, um, so phytoplankton and ice algae are quite different from each other. Uh, there are couple of examples of um, uh, cases where ice algae seeded uh, a bloom along the ice edge, but it's actually fairly rare. So it seems to be a very separate community from the phytoplankton. Um, all right, so uh, right, how did I get into this? I was going to talk about the fact that these things are growing on the bottom instead of up here, even though that's where the light is. Um, so why is that? Well, there's two factors that probably conspire to focus algal growth at the ice bottom. And the first is um, temperature, of course. Everything in the Arctic is about temperature, right? Um, so uh, the top of the ice is in contact with the atmosphere, and the atmosphere is very cold. So generally, the upper parts of the ice are much colder than the lower parts of the ice. The lower parts of the ice uh, are in contact with the water. The water is basically always pegged at about minus two. <clears throat> so there's a big temperature difference, and that is probably part of what's going on. Now, we have certainly found organisms throughout the ice. Um, <coughs> They're, the ones that are in the upper part of the ice, we're not really sure how active they are. Um, uh, Karen Yuga from uh, Jody, Jody Deming's group 
showed some years ago that uh, bacteria at least are active um, in sea ice down to at least minus 20. Um, but they, while they are active, it is very slow. Right? And there's a big difference in temperature between minus 20 and minus 2. Um, so that is probably part of what's going on. But probably what's more important is the nutrient flux. Um, the biomass inside the bottom of the ice can be very, very dense. It's like taking an entire water column and squeezing it into a couple of centimeters. And so the nutrient flux that's required to support that is um, pretty high. And the source of the nutrients for the sea ice is um, the underlying water. In the Arctic, the, the water has a lot of nutrients in it, particularly at the end of winter. And so <clears throat> it's very much the same sort of story uh, as you get in, uh, in a water column. Um, both in the ice and in the water column, you have opposing gradients of, of light and nutrients. The light is high at the top, decreases with depth. Nutrients tend to go the opposite way. And um, when you have that kind of situation, um, theory suggests, as well as everyone's observations suggest, that you will tend to get uh, the formation of an algal layer at some intermediate depth, where the algae get both light and nutrients. And that's what happens in the water column, um, um, and I think that that's also what's happening in the, uh, in the ice column. Um, and I like this paper by Klaus Meyer and Richmond called Algal Games, so where they did a, a theoretical model on this. Um, their interest was the water column, and all I've done is suggested that basically where this happens in the ice is right near the ice water interface. Um, now, most research that has been done uh, on the microbiology of sea ice has focused on, naturally, I think, um, this bottom layer, let's say the bottom 10 centimeters or so of the ice. And that makes sense. I mean, I, I, I think I mean, most of my work has also focused on that layer. Um, that is where pretty much everything has its maximum value. That's where you have the most chlorophyll. That's where you have the highest cell counts. That's where you have the most POC on a concentration basis. That's where you have the highest concentrations of DOC. That's where you have the highest concentrations of nutrients. That's where the highest nutrient fluxes are. Everything that you want to measure from a biological perspective peaks right down here um, at near the ice water interface. Um, but actually, it turns out um, we've done some uh, whole col ice column uh, work. And um, from the perspective of the carbon budget of the ice, uh, it turns out that actually most of the carbon is up here, um, even though this layer is the most dynamic. So uh, the lowest 10 centimeters of the ice is where the action is. But By carbon, you mean organic or inorganic? Uh, sorry, organic carbon, yeah. Yeah, that's my biased perspective. <laughs> uh, most of the, most of the car organic carbon budget is, is up here. Um, and that's relatively easy to show. Um, most work. Um, on ice algae, you know, they, they, like I said, uh, they may be sampling the bottom 10 centimeters, sometimes only the bottom 6 centimeters, or even the bottom 4 centimeters of the ice. Um, but we uh, went out and we sampled the entire ice column, chopping the ice into seg 10 centimeter segments, um, and analyzing um, <coughs> everything we could. Here's some examples of some of that data. Um, so, uh, let's see. So, here we have a couple of pools of uh, organic material that you find inside the ice. Uh, so chlorophyll, POC, and DOC. And these are organized as time series going from December to, uh, to June. Um, and the bars are showing the percent of the respective pool that is found above the bottom layer. Okay, so the bottom layer is the bottom 10 centimeters where the, the algal um, bloom is. Um, and if you look at chlorophyll, uh, as you go through time, um, the percent that's of the total that is found in above the bottom layer goes down, right? So that means that more and more is being is occurring in that bottom 10 centimeters, and that makes sense because that's where the bloom is happening. Uh, and then you get um, export, and suddenly the, there's not very much chlorophyll in the bottom any longer, and so then a lot is the, the majority is found in the in the whole uh, the upper part of the ice column. All right. Well, that makes sense. But if you consider, let's say, POC or DOC, that's not the case. Um, and it's not that the POC or DOC concentrations are particularly high, it's just that there's a lot of ice. So when you integrate you know, across a meter and a half depth, uh, of depth, 
um, it, it makes up a large chunk of the total. So something like 75% of the POC in the ice is found above the bottom, um, 10 centimeters, even though the highest POC concentrations are found at the bottom 10 centimeters. And for the DOC, something like 90% of the, of the DOC is found um, above that bottom layer. So you cannot ignore, if you're interested in the carbon budget for the ice, you cannot ignore um, what's happening in the upper part of the ice column. So here's a little cartoon that kind of summarizes our thinking um, about what's going on. So um, the seasonal cycle is driven you know, by what's going on. Um, uh, you know, it, it's cold and dark in the wintertime in the Arctic. No kidding. Uh, uh, at some point, the sun comes up. Um, but uh, day length is pretty short, and the solar angle is, you know, <laughs> doesn't make it very far above the horizon. And so even though there's enough light that you can start to get some photosynthesis, um, it's still pretty cold. And so all during this period, the ice is gradually thickening. Uh, eventually, you get uh, increasing day length, the solar angle improved, and you start to get some warming. And so at some point, ice growth stops, but the ice persists for a long time at a, you know, about a meter and a half thick in the area that we're working in. And then, you know, at some point, the ice breaks up, like I said, in, in the late June or, or July. Well, as this ice is growing, as, as it is thickening, and, uh, is it, we think that most of the carbon that you find in the ice is actually alloxinous. So it is getting incorporated into the ice matrix during the freezing process. And so this upper reservoir is primarily alloxinous. Uh, once you have some light that is available, you get this algal bloom. And so near the bottom of the ice, you have um, autoxinous carbon production. And that gets incorporated into the ice. Stays there for a while. Um, and then at some point, the algae and so on are exported from the ice. Um, and so, uh, so there, there is not only a quantitative difference. I mean, like I said, most of the carbon, uh, most of the organic carbon in the ice is found up here. But it is a probably very different origin than the carbon that's down here. One thing that we don't know anything about is how um, how labile this material is. It, it's very possible that it, you know, it doesn't change in terms of its bulk quantity very much through time. So it seems like it might just get incorporated into the ice during freezing and then it goes back out again. Um, uh, but this stuff down here, the autoxinous organic carbon, um, is probably much more labile. So you have this, uh, this upper reservoir that is probably not particularly active, and then you have this lower active layer. So sometimes it's like the ice column is sort of flipped over from the water column. And the water column, you know, the production and uh, the autoxidous production um, and the dynamic part of the carbon budget is near the surface. And then it's the deep water that holds all of this, you know, it, the majority of the, of the organic carbon is in the deep water, but it is perhaps less active. So it's sort of flipped around relative to what you think about in the water column. Of course, the time scales are also very different. Well, so, so I'm interested in what happens here. So um, to get this bloom of algae in the bottom of the ice, they're, they're fixing carbon and so on. Um, a lot of that carbon comes in the form of this mucusy goo that they produce. Um, and, uh, and then at some point, um, the algae biomass goes down within the ice, um, and that happens long before the ice falls. So it's not that the ice is melting and the algae are just kind of going away with the ice. They leave the ice while it is still there. Okay. Um, so uh, here's another way of looking at some time series data of what's going on in the ice. And in this case, I'm just going to focus on the bottom 10 centimeters. OK, so let's, uh, so again, time series going from December to June. Uh, this, let's just look at this green line here. This is showing the chlorophyll concentration in the bottom 10 centimeters of the ice. And you see this sort of you know, standard bloom, uh, relatively slow growth, and then it picks up a little bit as uh, sunlight gets stronger, and then uh, the bloom crashes and you lose a lot of the algae. OK, that makes sense. Um, now let's look at the black line. That's POC in the bottom 10 centimeters. OK, so POC. 
is relatively low initially, and then it increases concomitantly with the bloom of algae. That makes sense. Um, but it stays high, even though the algae goes away. And the same thing happens with DOC. I mean, DOC goes up perhaps more gradually than, uh, than the POC, but it does rise uh, as the bloom is occurring, probably because of production uh, by the algae. Um, and then when the, the algal concentration drops, you see it doesn't really change that much. Um, here's another year's worth, well, it's not another year's worth of data, but here's data from another year. Um, a little bit more highly temporally resolved. Um, so we kind of caught this near the end of the, of the bloom in this particular chunk of ice. Um, so there was some increase in algae from, uh, I think this was May 12th to May 21st. Um, so we increase in chlorophyll, and then a precipitous drop. In fact, we lost 70% of the chlorophyll in the ice bottom within five days. Um, but when this drop in algae occurred, we did not see much change um, in the POC or the DOC. So that's intriguing. Um, before I go on to explain what's going on there, let's take a look and see what that looks like. What does it look like when you see these changes happening uh, in uh, underneath the ice? So here we are. Uh, this is uh, May 14th of this year. Uh, we're on the Chukchi Sea. Uh, near near Barrow, uh, and what we've done is we've drilled a whole bunch of holes in the ice right next to each other so that we had one hole that was big enough that we could put a camera system down. So I'm about to uh, deploy this camera system, um, pouring it into the into the water. So we're approaching top of the water, going through there, and now we're going through the ice, which is about a meter and a half thick, so it takes a little while to get through it. Um, and uh, now you can see the bottom. This is the ice water interface down here at the bottom of the hole. And as soon as the camera gets low enough, you'll start to be able to see, see this discoloration there? And it'll improve in a moment. Okay, so there's some pigmentation at the bottom of the ice. I hope you guys can see that. Um, and that's the ice algae that are growing near the ice, um, near the bottom of the ice. Now this is pretty early in the bloom, and so there's not that much pigmentation, but a few weeks later, um, we came back in the same location. So this is May 26th, and the bloom is pretty much at its peak at this point. There's a lot of pigmentation underneath the ice. Um, and one thing I want to point out is, if you look in the water, there's not a lot of particles in the water. Some bubbles went by, but otherwise not too much. Okay, three days after that, um, May 29th, and we're starting to see some export of material from the bottom of the ice. Um, and so there's some patches that are starting to form that are a little bit clearer, and if you look carefully, like right there, you'll see that there's some particles going through the water. Okay, and here's a close-up looking at the ice undersurface. And so you can see that the algae have kind of molded themselves up into these things, and pay attention to this one right here. That is just about to let go, and there it goes. Okay, so that's export, right? <laughs> um, here's, a, here's another view. Um, so pay attention, there's this strand right here. This is just about to let go, and there it goes. Okay? Now what you probably didn't see was the, um, was the tinafore that was going by in the background. But don't worry, there's another one coming. Oh, here it comes. Oh, that's gonna hurt. <laughs> but, but notice all of, the, all of the particles that are going by. So this is all the stuff that's coming off of the ice. Okay, so now we, we take the camera, we put it all the way down to the bottom. It's not that deep here, it's only about 10 meters. Um, and so you see all this stuff that's floating down, and if you could see this with, you know, on my computer screen, it's a little easier to tell. So these are chunks of algae that are floating down to the bottom. And, and so this, this uh, algal material is raining down to the bottom, and in fact, there does seem to be a response by the venting organisms. In fact, um, <laughs> there are many, um, many planktonic and, and marine um, organisms, Arctic <coughs> organisms that seem to time significant life cycle events, such as that one, um, to uh, this, these kind of export events. And then this is three days later, three days after that. Totally blank, totally blank. So you know, in the past, when we showed people uh, these, uh, people who we showed, we showed reviewers, uh, these, the data um, showing the decline of algae within the ice, and we claimed that that was evidence for export, and they said, well, how do you know it's really export? Well, we're, Ice 
iced end at this point. Mm -hmm. We've lost the bottom of some of the bottom here. Yeah. Yeah. At least not that we can measure. All right, so, uh, so when you lose the algae from the bottom of the ice, it is dramatic. It happens over the course of a couple of days, and it is a massive flux. And it, this event is probably a key connection between the ice ecosystem and the rest of the Arctic marine ecosystem. So uh, prior to that event, those two systems, um, although they are right next to each other, I think that they are somewhat separated. Um, because the ice algae and other organisms inside the ice are protected and at least to some extent inaccessible while they're inside of the ice. Why does it detach? Is it melting of the lower part? I'll get to that in a okay. moment. <laughs> um, okay, so, uh, so, but once, of course, once they get into the water column, then it's fair game, right? So, uh, and it seems like uh, planktonic and many consumers seem to respond to that export pulse. Um, so, what is it that causes these events? It's really interesting. Um, it, one thing that many people have noticed, and this goes back to observations that have been made in the 60s, is that it is uh, tempor temporally correlated with snow melt. So, um, uh, typically, you get export just about at the time when snow goes from a couple centimeters to zero. Gradual, snow melting, snow melting, snow melting, and then you get right. And all the time, the bloom is increasing in the ice bottom, and then suddenly you go to kind of close to zero snow, and then all of a sudden you get an export event. So it seems to be triggered by something related to snow depth. Um, and in fact, we, you know, we have shown, and many other people have shown, that you can do this experimentally. If you um, go to a site and you shovel away all the snow, which is pretty easy to do, um, you can cause export locally. <clears throat> so this is just some data from a paper that was published a couple years ago, where we did just that. We just uh, cleared away snow from some plots, and then what we're showing here is the initial snow thickness um, and the algal net growth rate. Um, and so I'll put this line here just to highlight that, you know, if you're down here, that means negative net growth rate, which means you're losing algae, right? <clears throat> um, and so the thicker the snow is, um, initially, the more rapidly you lose algae after you remove the snow. Okay, so there's some kind of a connection between removal of snow, whether it's natural or whether it is artificial, that causes lots of algae from the ice bottom. And so then the question is, all right, well, that's great. So what does snow cover on the top of the ice have to do with algae on the bottom of the ice? And the answer is uh, light. Um, so um, what we did was we embedded a whole bunch of PAR sensors um, into the ice, um, and uh, then we were able to connect the amount of PAR that was reaching, um, let's say, the top of the algal layer, more or less, um, uh, under areas with different snow cover. And it's a pretty strong relationship. Um, this is a snow depth uh, as a fun and sorry, PAR. Um, photosynthetically active radiation um, as a function of snow depth. And uh, snow depth explains the vast majority of the um, variance uh, within PAR, uh, despite the fact that you have clouds and everything else that's going on. Um, and in fact, the data from two separate years, uh, the regression is essentially identical. So um, snow depth is the key in terms of light. Um, it, um, and so what happens when you remove snow is you're increasing light to the algae. So why does that cause the algae to be lost? Well, there have been a number of mechanisms that have been proposed by various people over the years. Um, people have suggested, you know, I mean, that's not just light that's coming, uh, but also, of course, the light causes the ice to warm up. And so um, you could get heating of the ice that could form more brine, and that could cause, and then that brine through gravity will sink, and that flow um, could theoretically carry the algae away. Um, if that was true, then you would expect to see the areas with greatest algal loss should have the most brine drainage. Um, and while that does occur, it certainly doesn't occur all the time, uh, it has also been proposed um, that the algae, you know, they're photosynthetic, so they are made to absorb light. And when they do that, they heat up. And so it is possible that they themselves could heat up sufficiently to essentially melt themselves out of the ice. That is theoretically plausible. And if that was true, then you would expect that areas that have higher biomass should also have higher algal loss. Right? 
right? So there's more stuff to absorb the light, it should get hotter, and there should be more loss. And sometimes that's true, sometimes it's not. Um, and, uh, and then there's, uh, um, well, the heating up the ice could also cause uh, bottom ablation, in other words, uh, melting of the ice from the bottom up. So that was the case that you would expect to see a decrease in ice thickness. And certainly it's true, if you see a decrease in the ice thickness, you generally will lose the algae. But you will often lose algae even though there's no measurable change in the ice thickness. So all of these, you know, they, sometimes they're true, but not always. So these are all plausible mechanisms. They have some empirical support. Um, none of them explain all of the observations. Now it could be that there's sort of a complicated interplay between these different uh, mechanisms because none of these are exclusive, right? So they could all be happening simultaneously. So that's one possible explanation. But uh, none of these explain our recent findings that the algal biomass mass is lost even while the POC and the DOC are retained. If, uh, if these strictly physical processes were happening, then you would expect all kinds of stuff to go out at the same time. And that's not what happens. Flux from the ice seems to be discontinuous with the algae first and other things later. And I also just don't like the fact that these are all strictly physical properties or explanations. I mean, the algae themselves should respond to altered light. And so maybe something that the algae themselves do has something to do with um, these export events. Well, so let's go back to this you know, cartoon of where you find uh, an algal layer in uh, uh, when you have opposing gradients of light and nutrients. <clears throat> okay, so um, the Klaus Meyer and Richmond uh, modeled uh, where you would find algae in a water column that was poorly made. They modeled low tile algae, although it kind of works regardless of whether they can really move or not, depending on the very varying time scale. Anyway, the point is, where, where do you find algae within uh, a water column that is poorly mixed when you have opposing gradients of light and nutrients? And you know what they found was that um, you find them someplace where they get a little bit of nutrients and a little bit of light. That's where you will form the, the biomass maximum. And I explained that, I brought that up before as an explanation of why you find the algae near the ice bottom. But uh, Klausmeyer and Lichman actually uh, went a little bit further than that and they showed, you know, what, what they predicted what would happen if you changed the light levels. And so if you have relatively low light, <clears throat> let's say for example if you have high snow, um, you would expect the algal biomass layer to form um, further up within the water column or the ice column as the case may be. Um, so under high snow, you expect um, relatively low biomass, but, and it should be further from, let's say, the ice water interface. Okay. If you have a medium snow cover, you expect that layer to move down a little bit, um, closer to the ice water interface, and you should have a little bit more biomass. Um, and if you have very thin snow cover, um, you should find the algal biomass layer right next to the ice water interface. Um, uh, and not only that, but the biomass layer should be, um, I mean, there should be more biomass in it. The layer should be very, very thin. The higher the light is, the thinner that layer becomes. So that's an interesting theoretical prediction. Does it have any validity? Well, fortunately, manipulating snow cover and therefore the light levels inside the ice is something that is very easy to do. We don't need any high tech devices. We need a shovel, <laughs> um, maybe a saw. We can cut out the snow blocks. Um, and so we can set up experimental plots with different snow depths. And it's actually fairly easy because of where we are. Um, the fact that we are, you know, have a field station right there, we can go out to the same location and we can maintain plots like you know, a plot like this, free of snow, for uh, as long as several weeks. Um, and then we can go back, and we can core out the ice and see what happens with that. So remember, this is our prediction, right? And these are actual cores. I think the result is pretty obvious. Uh, so here's, here's the core under thick snow. So this is low light, and the bottom of the core is here. This is the ice water interface. There's the band of algae. This is about five centimeters separated from the ice water interface. Um, here under medium snow, um, you should be able to see that the biomass, the pigmentation is a little bit higher. This band is much further down. And under low snow or high light, um, again, higher biomass and even closer to the ice water interface. Um, these are data from those cores showing the distribution, the vertical distribution of chlorophyll <coughs> in uh, a couple of depth bins 
So zero to two centimeters from the ice water interface, two to six centimeters from the ice water interface, and six to 10 centimeters from the ice water interface. And so for this core, 81% 80, of the chlorophyll was found six to 10 centimeters from the interface. And that maximum layer moves down as you go um, to thinner snow cover. Okay. Um, so what happens if you have no snow? So like why, why does it go down rather than filling up more of the column with algae? Um, okay, so um, I think what's happening is, you know, you have this, this is intense, this is a very um, high biomass layer, and there's a tremendous amount of nutrients being sucked up by those guys. And so, um, um, so, all right, so the, uh, the idea is they want to move up to get to higher light, but they're forced to stay closer to the interface because that's where the nutrients are coming from. The more biomass you have, the more nutrients get sucked up and the less nutrients make it further up. And so there's, in order to balance those two gradients, they have to keep moving closer to the ice water interface as production gets higher and higher and the nutrient demands get higher and higher. So they have to be closer to the source. Now, when you have no snow, so very, very high light, um, you'll see they're even closer to the ice water interface. Um, there, you know, there's virtually nothing uh, on the six to 10 layer. Um, and, uh, and, and you know, the biomass here, maybe a little bit hard to see, but the pigmentation here is less than there. And we think the discrepancy is that the stuff that was here is no longer there. It's out in the water column. <clears throat> was there self-shading possibilities? Um, Certainly, certainly, yeah. I mean, the, the, the uh, that's, yeah, I mean, that would kind of work to drive things further up, right? Because they would be competing with each other. Well, exactly, that's the thing. So, so that's the balance that they have to strike. I mean, as they, uh, as the biomass goes up, there's more shading, so you want to get further away from the interface where the nutrients are coming from, but then you cut off your nutrient source. Based on those observations, we have proposed a new hypothesis for what drives export events, or at least contributes to the export events. So as, as snow melts in late spring, um, light in the ice increases, and ice algae move closer to the ice water interface to optimize, better optimize the supposed gradients of light and nutrients. And once they congregate near that interface, um, then they are definitely going to be more susceptible to various loss mechanisms whether it is brine drainage, or whether it is melting uh, by light absorption, or whether it is simply you know, being carried away by the currents. Um, if you are at the ice water interface, you're more likely to um, get um, exported into the water column. It is also possible that they may just actively move into the water column. I mean, they don't know where the ice stops, I think, in a we would. Um, and so when the optimal location is deeper than the bottom of the ice, they might just pop themselves off. In any case, the consequence of this behavioral response means that the cells are lost from the ice, but they leave behind all of this goo that they produced, the POC and the DOC, mostly in the form of this EPS network. Um, and so that's why you get a, a preferential loss of chlorophyll and cells relative to um, these bulk organic carbon Like I said, I'm pretty sure that I, I'm pretty sure I wasn't going to make it to the uh, to the sinking rate stuff. So I'm just going to, given the time, I'm just going to uh, jump ahead to um, my summary. And uh, if somebody wants to uh, talk to me more about what happens next. So what a lot of what we're focusing on right now is uh, what happens next, with the idea that um, okay, we have a mechanism that perhaps uh, explains why you have material going into the water column when it does, but then what? Um, and what we think is that, um, at least first order, the sinking rate is what controls um, the most immediate fate. So things that sink slowly are going to be consumed preferentially in the water column. Things that sink fast, like those big aggregates that we were able to film, those things definitely go down to the benthos. And so 
um, whether they get used in the, in the plankton or whether they get used in the, in the bentos um, is largely related to the sea temperature. So, um, so just to summarize, ice algae, they live in porous sea ice, they bloom in the spring, and that's make a significant contribution to the Arctic marine food web. Um, they, they drive the organic carbon budget in the lower or active layer of the ice, uh, although the majority of, uh, of the organic carbon in sea ice is probably relatively inactive, and, and, and uh, the bulk of it, at least in an integrated sense, is found above the, the ice bottom. <coughs> um, uh, the connection between the ice ecosystem and the rest of the Arctic marine uh, food web is probably greatest after these dramatic export events from the sea ice. Uh, and uh, export coincides temporally with snow melt, uh, which may have something to do with uh, uh, the downward vertical migration by the algae as white levels go up. And then what I didn't have a chance to talk about was the sinking rates. And you know, obviously, um, you saw that there were very big particles. And there are big particles that are released from the ice. They sink at hundreds of meters per day, and uh, that's quite easy to measure. But um, the work that we have done shows that actually the majority of the mass really sinks at about, about less than a meter per day. Um, and uh, we also found that um, sinking rates are uh, highly affected by road conditions within the ice. So there's a lot of spatial variability depending on environmental conditions and things. Um, and uh, I think that's what the restoration is. Thank you very much. By the way, if you like those, uh, if you like that video, I encourage you to either go to my website or go to my uh, video album. A lot of Arctic. <laughs> a lot of Arctic uh, videos are. So, are there any group reports that work the other side of the ice? There are. There certainly are. Um, <clears throat> there's a, there's a, um, uh, both, um, uh, kind of like the equivalent of, of, of the microscope plant, um, amoebae and, and uh, heterotrophic dinoflagellates that live inside the ice. There's also larval stages of metazoans that, um, particularly in this area, there's a lot of uh, polychaete larvae that live inside the ice. Um, tons of nematodes uh, that are found inside the ice. Um, and, uh, and sometimes, and, well, our practically copepods uh, make it pretty far. And sometimes we find planktonic copepods that have made it some distance up into the ice. And presumably they're grazing, I don't know. But I, I'm guessing that they do, otherwise, why would they be there? So it's qualitatively it's different than what goes on in the Antarctic. Yeah, you don't, early life stage of the exactly. going yeah, out. You don't have the. There are amphipods that live on the bottom of the ice, and um, you know I do. You know you do see them in the in the move in the videos. They're moving their appendages, um, but all of the data that I have seen, where people have tried to quantify the uh, losses to grazing, have come up with really 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 low numbers, like two percent, something like that. Um, so uh, so the best estimates now are that. The ice algae are not significantly grazed. I don't know if that's really true. I find it a little bit unlikely. But nevertheless, everybody who's worked on it comes to that conclusion. So, yeah. yeah I have two questions. One just requires. Can you talk louder? One, one just requires very short answer. What was your range of sinking rates of the particles? Um, the highest that we were able to measure was about 900 meters per day, and the lowest is zero. Okay, the second question. <laughs> Yes. It's produced more when nutrient concentrations are low. So you're going to get a different EPS production rate like close to the, the ice in that same range you're interested in. The EPS, it seems to me, would also, or at least more the mucus inside of the, the EPS spectrum, would also affect the freezing rate of those, those brine channels and things like that. Yeah. It, and, and so what, what it, I mean, you're looking for a biological factor, and that would also be that. And it seems to me that that could have something to do with the freezing thawing and actually perhaps thaw the water right at that interface. That the EPS may be playing a role in that. What do you think of that? Oh, yeah, definitely. Um, the, if you, um, so my friend Christopher um, uh, is the one that um, had recently published a paper um, looking at. Um, properties of the ice and how they relate to the EPS concentration. And, um, and if you compare essentially abiotic ice to ice that has EPS in it, very different. The, the brine channel structure is totally different. Um, the uh, thermal conductivity is totally different. 
uh, the, the hardness of the ice is totally different. I mean, it makes a huge impact on the ice. Now, people who you know, work on the ice physics don't really know about that <laughs> because it makes things really complicated. Um, but definitely, the heat shift has a, has a big effect. Um, and, and it's complicated, so I don't know that I would necessarily be able to figure out which direction it's going to go in terms of that particular yeah, question. Okay. I think you probably could argue it either way, depending on the concentration of the EPS. You know. But um, yeah, yeah, no, I'm sure it plays a huge role. Um, what we see when we melt, when the ice is melting, you know, you get these, uh, these, these strands of algae that form, and we stain them um, with alcine blue. And you know, they're, they're hanging from these EPS strands. And, and probably what happens is they anchor themselves up inside the ice. Um, on the EPS and eventually kind of wander their way down the strand and then plop, plop, plop. Oh, so many questions. <laughs> I, I have to apologize for coming in late. For some, you may have discussed this, but I, I wondered how the taxonomic groups of ice algae may hardly explain the results. I've seen pictures of, of say, Melisira, huh? which my understanding is a lens on the other side compared yeah. to uh, yeah. the many algae that are right. Uh, so um, of that material, that big clumpy material coming off, do you know about like what the composition of it was in terms of different species of algae? Yes, we've looked at that. We haven't published anything on it. Uh, those kinds of analyses take a lot longer than doing the bulk analyses, which is what we have mostly focused on so far because it's kind of a lower hanging fruit. Um, but we do have a tremendous number of samples that are slowly being analyzed microscopically. So the material that's being sloughed off the ice bottom um, is very similar to the stuff that is found in the ice earlier. Um, uh, yeah, I think that's, that, that's, that's the quick answer. Um, uh, Melosyrum is more characteristic of pack ice than of this ice, uh, this landfast seasonal ice. And um, this year I was up, um, I was up in Barrow, and uh, uh, Ralph Gradinger from uh, University of Alaska Fairbanks was up there teaching a class, and he's been working in this region for literally for decades. I think probably 30 years. He's been collecting uh, samples from Barrow, and he was. I ran into him one day, and he was very excited because um, he found, for the first time, Melisira in the ice near Barrow. And he was pretty excited. <laughs> and uh, we put our camera system under the ice, and we found a huge one, an enormous, huge balloon. But it was just in one particular chunk of ice. And so what I don't know is whether that was a piece of pack ice that got frozen in and came in, or whether it's just part of a, a seasonal progression, you know, um, as the ice ages, it becomes obviously much more like the pack ice. And so it could be that late in the season, the Melisira starts to bloom uh, once the conditions are appropriate. Once you lose that interstitial algal layer, then there's a lot of light in the water column. But the water column is still mixed. And so it's not, it's not really favorable to be, it's favorable to be in the water from a nutrient perspective. It's not favorable to be mixed from a light perspective. Melisira is the perfect compromise between those two because it attaches itself to the bottom of the ice and then hangs in these meter long strands down into the water column. And if you go to my movie Blue album, <laughs> you can see some of the images that we have which are awesome of these long strands of algae hanging down into the water. And so I sent that to Ralph and I said, yeah, we found some too. <laughs> <laughs> um, anyway. Why does the ice get thicker when it, like the spring begins? summer is really thin and, and when it gets really warm enough the ice breaks up but if there's that period yeah, of it ice continues growth, to grow yeah, yeah. what's well I guess think about the, the, the essentially the heat capacity you know it gets super cold uh, in the winter time and it remains really really cold the core of the ice even in uh, you know sort of the middle part of the ice um, even in early May is still way below freezing and so um, it continues to have a heat capacity Early to the um, is there a possibility that the um, algae are breaking off of the ice because of depth? And then also, um, when you see like the progression, um, like the difference in the snow melt, snow on top, 
um, when they migrate, like, is it possible that they can only live in a certain, like, amount of, like, a certain amount of light? And, like, do they die throughout the colonial phase? Oh, as it moves. Yeah. Well, okay, so, yeah, I mean, that's an interesting question. You know, the ice gets thicker, and as the ice gets thicker, that algal layer keeps moving down. And so is it that, basically, you're just getting new growth, mm -hmm. and there's stuff left behind? Or are the algae actually migrating downwards through time? And I don't really know the answer to that question. Lots of people have puzzled over it, because mm -hmm. it is an obvious observation, but it's not really totally easy to answer. Um, we certainly see dead crustules in the ice. Um, I don't know that it's really enough Huh? You know, um, many of these diatoms are motile. Some of them are not. Yeah, they glide. They glide in, this, in the EPS. The, the EPS is really important for the mm -hmm. for the motility. Um, I like to think of this uh, it's very analogous to what happens in the in the benthos. In the benthos, you have uh, also um, a matrix of hard stuff and water. Uh, and you have, so you have very high porosity and substrate at the same time, and you have diatoms, appendicles and appendix diatoms, live there, uh, and they vertically migrate mm -hmm. in response to light. It's very similar, mm -hmm. I think. It's just that, the, that the, the substrate in the case of ice happens to be transparent. But other than that, it's really analogous. Okay. So, you know, this rapid boom and then really rapid crash, you brought up self shading, this could be really important for you, perhaps. But, but also, you know, you talked about nutrient limitation, and I might expect a, a, a lot of nutrient limitation. You know. it, it would be very difficult, I think, to try to measure nutrients at the bottom of the ice. Oh, so because, yeah. because yeah. You know, the melt that you release nutrients unless you can do a spectroscopic. But if you try to measure it at the bottom of the ice, it's not very turbulent in this area and, and model what nutrient fluxes might be. Uh, I have not. <laughs> Other people have tried to do that. Um, and uh, uh, the consensus is that um, that the, the water is uh, a very big source for the um, lower part of the ice. Uh, the upper parts of the ice are somewhat isolated. Um, and, uh, you know, particularly in near shore areas, uh, tidal pump is, is a big mechanism for forcing water up in there. Um, so there might be some. But yeah, you're right. I mean, it would be very, it is difficult to get good numbers from that bottom layer because it is very, very porous. And when you pull the core out, you know, you right. I just wonder if you like that. But the highest maximum rate, the maximum productivity, I wonder if you can just use enough nutrients. There's some evidence based on uh, physiological measurements of the algae that um, that towards the end of the bloom, uh, they are nutrient stressed. And so I think you can use the algae tell you what's going on down there better than you could measure directly. And uh, for sure, the physiology changes. Um, although, you know, the ones that are closest to the ice water interface are actually the happiest. Um, the yeah. um, there have been experiments before that um, examined how the mucus can affect the movement of nutrients in pore spaces in the mm -hmm. sediment. Yeah. And I was wondering how that could affect the, um, the movement of the nutrients up or down the ice core because yeah. there's a size occlusion factor. Right, right, right. Yeah, so it doesn't clock things up essentially. Um, yeah, probably. <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, yeah, yeah sure. it, it's a good idea. You know, actually, um, uh, <coughs> uh, one of the ideas that we thought about was um, how much pumping could you drive by flatworms moving through the, the brine channel. Because they essentially, you know, because they're squishy, they kind of fill the whole channel and it's like a flood moving through the, through the channel. But obviously the water needs to move in front of them. So um, you need to come back and both calculate that. Then, um, in, in some sense, yeah, exactly. Yeah. So, um, uh, yeah, there's a lot of interesting questions that you can ask about that. Um, a lot of them are really difficult to deal with. One of the big problems that we have is it is almost impossible to grow ice in the laboratory that looks anything like natural sea ice. Um, and that is a big limitation. And so a lot of this stuff is really hard to do. Maybe that's the last question, I guess. Yeah. Um, 
one of the most impressive things we, we showed is that the algae are kind of glocky and they, they sink fast. And now, you would, go to the thing we can see. Yeah, well, um, you would ex say if this is an adaptation. Mm -hmm. um, if you expect these algae to be leaving the bottom and you're working in shallow water, you're not giving up much light. Uh, and they are getting more nutrients. Have you looked at deeper water where you expect the, if they had the same adaptations to sinking, mm -hmm. they would be doing suicide? Right, yeah, yeah, no, I mean, you could say, you could before, maybe that's part of the seasonal cycle, is you, you sink really fast down to the bottom so you don't get eaten along the way, and then you hang out in the sediments for a while. If it's shallow. Yeah. Uh, have you looked at deeper sites um, to compare whether they still form these yeah. blobs that sink fast? Yeah, we have not. Other people have. Um, and they do. And they do. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. So that doesn't mean that that answer is not correct. I mean, it just means it doesn't work everywhere, right? But it still has to be a strategy. Might it be possible to <clears throat> design an experiment where you would set up some sort of a floating framework where you may be able to embed a bunch of light sensors? Mm -hmm and then maybe some plumbing that you could draw, just before the ice freezes, draw off samples for nutrient concentration of depth and then let the sea freeze around it, mm -hmm. and maybe when it had frozen, do some As soon as it sequesters over Or is it just too rough, the sea is just the sea too rough? It's it would be hard to put that in, it would be hard to put that in before the ice freezes. You could go, um, you could do it, I mean, we'll, we do embed things in the ice, and so you could do that. Uh, one of the ways that people try to sample what's going on, you know, the horizon, I guess, is they drill a hole that doesn't go all the way through, and then theoretically the ground is going to 